I'm Indy Nidell, and I have a cold, and yet, in spite of that, this is another exciting episode of Out of the Trenches, where I sit here in my chair of wisdom and answer all your questions about the First World War. Douglas McNabb writes, Mm-hmm. Hi, Indy. I have a question for Out of the Trenches. Who invented the creeping barrage as it was used extensively used during the later stages of the war? Was it a normal infantryman or a high-ranking officer who invented it? Please tell me, and could you maybe do an episode on the barrage's history from Australia? The answer, if it was this guy or this guy, uh, neither. The creeping barrage wasn't like an idea that somebody goes, whoa, and just sprang into being from someone's mind. It was more of a next step in the evolution of artillery tactics. Like um, the Boer Wars, for example, showed the British commanders that an entrenched enemy with modern rifles made direct artillery fire nearly useless since you weren't firing on a target out in the open anymore. The solution was to refer to indirect fire and that demanded more complex calculations before you could get a clear firing solution. The more, well, the excessive use of timetables and uh, evaluating wind speed, angle, the, the distances. It allowed the artillerists to shift their guns by calculation and not necessarily on sight anymore. The first documented use, as far as I'm aware, of a shifting barrage was probably during the siege of Adrianople by the Bulgarians in 1913, as their artillery periodically shifted its fire from different defensive works in intervals. Some sources do go back to the American Civil War or even the Napoleonic Wars, but you really needed modern artillery pieces to effectively, effectively calculate the shelling. In the Great War, it was probably during late 1915, the first real creeping barrages were brought into existence. Now, as we explained before, the idea was that the attacking soldiers would follow in the wake of a curtain of artillery shells, which would not only destroy any opposition and any obstacles in its wake, but also create enough smoke and shell holes to provide cover for the infantry. This wasn't perfected, well, if it was perfected at all, until very late in the war. In the Nivelle Offensive, we can see well, how badly the system was implemented with guys like General Mangin, who boasted that his men would traverse 100 meters, in a mi 100 meters a minute, but in cold weather over a broken, muddy battlefield? The calculations were way off. The barrage crept away before the infantry and gave the Germans enough time to come out of cover and get on their defenses again. It was a tricky thing. Andy, the M320 guy, writes, Hello from Puerto Rico, Indian crew. Oh, hello from Berlin. Here's a question for Out of the Trenches. Uh, I was reading about the tanks in the Palestine front where I found out that of the eight tanks, only two reached their objectives. Oh, at Gaza, I guess, yeah. Uh, how true is this? I also read that tanks in the desert were a bit faster since there was no mud as a challenge. And in this case, were the tank tactics in the desert different than those at the Western Front or were they the same? P.S. I've been subscribed to your show since the beginning and I look forward for more exciting videos. Well, thank you very much, Andy from Puerto Rico. Um, well, well, in terms of mud, um, sand was at least as damaging to a tank as the mud on the Western Front would be. The tank engineers really didn't like sand. It was coarse, it was rough, it was irritating. It got everywhere. It clogged the exhaust outlets and its abrasive effect quickly wore down the tank's machinery. The British tried to modify their tanks with protective shields and a different track pattern that wouldn't get stretched out so much on the sand. But there was still the unbearable heat inside those machines. Um, their fate during the Second Battle of Gaza was mostly due to inexperience and their limited technical capacity. I mean, remember, they weren't much more than slow moving pillboxes at this point, right? The inexperienced British senior officers took command over the experienced junior officers and sent the tanks out undersupplied and in pairs, giving the defenders time to react to them and focus their fire. The officers hoped for the disheartening effect on the morale of the defenders, but to their surprise, the Ottomans under German commander Kress von Kressenstein, who I love mentioning every time I get to mention him, I think is great, under Kress von Kressenstein did not break and run away. Instead, they held fast and they focused their artillery. 
Most tanks broke down, and only one, a female Mark I, managed to penetrate the El Arish redoubt, fi firing 27,000 rounds and literally running amok with Turkish soldiers banging on its side to get in, as Stuart Hadaway describes it. Um, but it was pretty much a disaster for the British by this point, though. Uh, Darius Niederer writes, I have a question for Out of the Trenches. Since Germany made significant gains at the start of the war and later captured more Russian territory, wouldn't it have made sense for them to just make peace and use occupied France and Belgium as a bargaining chip? I would think that at least by 1915 people would have realized that a breakthrough was not going to happen on the Western Front. Germany could have come out of the war stronger than before, or at least could have cut their losses. Why was there no peace earlier? Well, um, it's what the Germans tried to do in a way. There were actually some peace initiatives that were initiated by the German Empire between 1914 and 1916, mostly towards Russia. Through the royal family and influential people of neutral Denmark, they tried to engage pro-German Russian politicians to make a separate peace. It's impossible to know, though, the exact propositions German Chancellor Theobald von bethmann hollweg made to Russia. Since this is all behind-the-scenes stuff through a lot of unofficial channels. But what we know is that Germany demanded some sort of gains in land and economic power and promised that it would not threaten Russia's power at sea. Uh, another thing we don't know are the personal thoughts of the Tsar to those proposals. What we know is that the Russians refused all of these offers. They certainly didn't want to break their treaties with the rest of the Entente. And maybe the concessions towards the Germans were too high to pay, and the Tsar feared that losing face toward the Germans would threaten the integrity of his rule. If you'd like to learn more about Russia leading up to the war, you can click right here for our special episode about that. Do not forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram. See you next time.